Hey everybody, we're uh, on just a minute early. Um, I am, whoa, that's not what I expected. Okay. When this, uh, this says view up here, what does that, what does that do if I click that? It might change your... Because I want to be able to get to, I, with it all the way enlarged like this? Go, go back to view. Okay, I thought so. Mm -hmm. Um, side by side. Exit full screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's where I want to be. Okay. okay, so the people are going to be across the top, but I can change this, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do I? You're going to put them on the side. Yeah, uh, are you going to leave Are you going to leave your mic, your um, video on, or are we both going to be? Is this, a, you don't need to leave your video on, right? No, I can turn mine off. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm going to record it. Um, So, uh, can't get into Zoom. You know, um, Gina, Gina had a similar problem. I had to close my browser. Look to see if anyone else comes. But Mitch just hit it. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, I gave Gene the new link. I, I I don't think it's a new link, but I had to close my browser and reopen it in order for my Zoom link to work. Uh, I it doesn't look like you all had a similar problem, uh, but Gene is having that problem right now. So we'll see if he can get in. And if I see him asking to get in, I will let him in because Patricia just walked away. All right, I have. Where'd my Zoom go? There we go. Hey, um, yeah, so it's time to get started. And uh, so I'll use a little repetition just we, in case we have some people coming in a little bit late. Uh, and plus this material may be new to many people and it might be a good idea to take our time and uh, do a little repetition anyway. Um, so if you're on Zoom, you can see on the screen it says searching the Bible for hell. And I'm holding it up for people to see who are on the live stream searching the Bible for hell. And we're going to start with Gehenna. You know, I have a suspicion that the, the folks who talk the most about, um, about hell, especially those that we've been, we've been talking about the bubbles we grew up in, the evangelical, more fundamentalist bubbles that we grew up in, where um, uh, there were ideas that were just sort of indoctrinated and brought along generation after generation. And one of the things that you know, that you might notice here is that even though you've heard about hell being a very real, real, real place, at the same time, you've also, the people who are talking the most about that might not be able to tell you, well, how many words uh, in the Bible are sometimes translated as the English word for hell, and what are those words, and what do they mean, and do they mean the same thing? So... Let's take a look at that. Go to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look it up in the dictionary, you're going to find probably what you expect. And uh, for those of you who are on the live stream, it didn't move. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Merriam-Webster, good a dictionary as any, I guess, two um, reasonable <clears throat> uh, definitions for what hell means in the English language for most people. I didn't say it was biblical. I said, this is what it means for most people. And number one is, another world in which the dead continue to exist, Hades. Now, the reason they put Hades there, I didn't put that there. They put that there. The reason they put Hades there is because um, it comes from Greek pagan mythology. It's the underground abode where people's souls or shades go. All people 
and they go down their spirits or souls or shades go down there and they live a life of kind of gray eventless tedious boredom it's not a place of torture but everybody goes there in an underground place run by a god named hades so that's one idea is that it's a netherworld usually considered underground uh, where the dead continue to exist in a boring bodily uh, spiritual kind of existence this is also uh, influenced not only by greek greco-roman uh, paganism but also by the philosophy philosophy of plato who was the one of the most significant writers in antiquity giving the outline of how the afterworld looks and operates if you ever want to read plato be my guest I, I don't find it particularly interesting but there you go next slide all right so in your Bible, there are four words, and these four words are sometimes, not always, sometimes translated as uh, the English definition, the second definition of hell, which has to do with a place of afterlife punishment. I guess you noticed that before, even though I didn't read it. It's a, you know, it's a nether realm uh, where the dead go. Uh, and the uh, devil and demons run the place, and you get punished forever. Usually involving fire, although the definition in Merriam-Webster didn't say so. So let's go back to this. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are your four words. You got Ge <clears throat> Gehenna, which we mispronounce, if you want to know how it's pronounced. It's Gehenna. And we got Hades. And uh, that's Hades. And we got Sheol, and that's Sheol in Hebrew. And we got Tartaru, which is Tartara'a. Do you hmm. believe that? No. So, uh, <laughs> uh, when I said that this morning, Jean said it sounded like I was speaking Klingon. Jean, are you out there yet? Jean can't get in. Oh. And I'm really worried about it. Maybe you can, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I texted him back, and I gave him the right link. He says he's having trouble getting in. Facebook seems to be working. Wondering if it's my connection. He, he's having trouble. Okay. Okay, we'll just have to... Gene, Gene has uh, been, you know, indispensable. So it's it's hard to go on without him. But this is our hour. So I'm going to keep going and hope that he figures it out. Maybe if he re reboots might help. I, I already know. told him to... Uh, well, not reboot. I told him to close and reopen his browser but he might have to reboot i don't know mm -hmm. all right and so we've got these four words that are sometimes but not always translated into english as hell so my question to you is uh should they be translated as hell are gehenna hades shale or tartaru in actuality described in the bible as places of afterlife torture because if they're not that's all we got it's these four words. Interestingly, Gehenna is a word that only appears 12 times in the Bible. And Hades is just 11. Now, Sheol appears a lot in the Old Testament. Um, but, of course, it, because it's a Hebrew word, it doesn't appear in the New Testament. And Tartaru appears once in Second Peter. And nobody ever knows that. And, and, and it really isn't as relevant to our discussion as Sheol and Hades and Gehenna. So we're going to look at those, uh, all those words, but especially starting with Gehenna, because it's the one that's associated most with fire and people associated with afterlife uh, uh, torture by fire. God's sort of the torture in a torture chamber kind of a thing that lasts 24-7 and your skin is seared all day long, all night long, forever and ever. Mm -hmm. That sounds nice. <laughs> that's worse than a sunburn. Of course. Okay. All right, so you might want to know what the most used nouns are. I can't see it on mine. i got to go back. Sorry. I, you, you might be interested to know what the most used nouns are in the New Testament. Now, this does not include proper names like Jesus, Mary, or Peter. But it does include name, um, words like God and Lord and man or human and Christ and father, etc. These are the most used nouns in the Bible. Where is Gehenna in this top 12? Well, obviously it's not there because it only occurs 12 times. It's in the bottom of the list of most used nouns, not the top. Now, 
The problem with this, to me, is I'll hold this back up again if, if I need to. And those of you who watch the recording, you can just stop it and look at it because I don't want to sit here wearing out my elbow the whole time. But here's the thing. In our evangelical bubbles that we all grew up in, um, they began their theology with Gehenna. Even though it's only used 12 times, even though they don't know what the word means, even though they don't know whether it should be translated as an afterlife torture place or not, they begin with it and they use a threat with it. So what they say is, if you don't do this, um, sort of take Jesus' little offer or option, you know, to get you, uh, to save you from God. By the way, that's the irony of evangelical theology is, is Jesus is supposed to somehow save us from God. What is wrong with that picture? I thought Jesus and the Father were one. I thought they were on the same page. I thought they were working together. They are. Yeah. I thought one God, three per three persons, one God, mm -hmm. same nature, same love, same purpose, same will. And yet evangelical theology says you've got to, you've got to get Jesus to talk God out of torturing you. That doesn't sound like they're on the same page. But at any mm -hmm. rate, that aside mm -hmm. for just a moment. Mm -hmm. okay, they, they begin with, if you don't take the Jesus option and make a decision of some kind, then you will, as planned, be tortured by the torture God over fire so that your skin sears 24-7. Alright, so what did they begin with? It's not good news. It's a threat. Just look at it for what it is. They're threatening and using terror to manipulate and control you. That's what it's for. Because... The church learned a long time ago, before there even was a Baptist church or a Methodist church or even Protestant churches, there, there was some way back in church history that learned, and I don't know who's to blame, I, I wish I could find the bozo and straighten him out, <laughs> but somebody realized, you know what, we're getting better attendance when we threaten people with hell, and we're getting more money too. They come more, they give more. Oh, it works. Well, forget the gospel, we're going to preach Gehenna. Hmm. And it's only occurred 12 times. Now look, look at, look at these words right here. These are the top words. I can give you a pretty good Christian theology without even trying hard using those words. God, who is Lord, through God the Son, who is God become human, became the Christ of Israel, the Messiah, sent to earth by a loving Heavenly Father to save the world, on a special day and time of his choosing, and through the wind or breath or spirit, the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to continue the message of grace and love in Jesus Christ, given to us through his Son, who is our brother and the Word of God become flesh. His presence is the presence of the kingdom of heaven among us, and we are his disciples disciples of his grace now i did that off the top of my head with the top 12 words and that's pretty close to what the bible says that's pretty close to the gospel that's pretty close to the creed that we proclaim okay and every sunday when we say i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth it sounds like a creed i use the top 12 words now what am i supposed to do with gehenna it occurs 12 times well what else occurs 12 times in the bible go to the next one please mm -hmm. Okay, along with mm. Gehenna, other words that occur 12 times in the Bible. Rooster, knee, net, reed, tooth, bowl, and pig. I can't make theology out of that. <laughs> I can write Dr. Seuss. The pig took his bowl and chipped his tooth. The reed made him slip, and the net on his knee killed the rooster. In Gehenna. <laughs> That's funny. But that ain't the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So what I'm pointing out is just a statistical fact. They've taken a word that occurs 12 times that they don't know what it means. They presume that it is a burning afterlife hell. And they threaten people with it in order to control and manipulate them. The question is, is there proof in the Bible? And we're going to look as hard as we can, and I'm not going to hide anything from you. I'm not going to manipulate anything. Don't believe what I'm saying. You can look any of this up for yourself. It's on a video right now. It's being recorded, okay? Go and check it for yourself. This is fact, just 12 times. And Jesus said 11 of them, and the 12th one is in the book of James. 
Jesus did say 11 of them, and we're going to look at six tonight. And guess what? They're identical repeats. They're not even new information. They're just use of it as, as a kind of symbol or metaphor for something. And we'll look at what that is. So what does Gehenna mean? What is this word? What is Gehenna? This would be something that if you were honest, even if you, you were a semi-honest evangelical scholar or skeptic, you would say, well, I, I need to look up what the word means. All right? Mm -hmm. You can look anywhere you want to. You're going to get the same answer. Gehenna is a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew words Gehenom. It means Valley of Hinnom. Is this a real place? Yes, it is. This was and is the valley that runs along the south side of Jerusalem. You can see it in this picture. Okay? On the south side of the Jerusalem, it's downhill. It's a deep valley. I'm going to show you a picture of it in just a second. All right? In Old Testament times, this is important, and I'll give you more on this too. In Old Testament times, before the Israelites came to this area and took the city of Jerusalem, the Jebusites were there, who were also related to, in many ways, the Ammonites and shared some of the same gods. And during that time, they used they did human sacrifices to an idol, to a god named Moloch. And the human sacrifices weren't just any human sacrifices. It was babies. They were sacrificing infants, children, to this Moloch god in that valley. This is a valley with a history that Jesus and the disciples and everyone who knew the Old, Old Testament back then, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who knew the Bible well, they knew what happened down there because it says it over and over and over again in the Old Testament. They Those Jebusites were sacrificing babies to this Moloch down in that valley. So we're talking about a valley where they worshipped idols, killed babies, and the place is, is, is full of the blood of innocent children, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a bad spot. On top of that, as time went by and the Israelites came in, this became the place where the sewage systems were drained to. And it was the place where they dumped their refuse. So this is the burning dump. They burned garbage there day and night. It's a place of idolatry. It's a place of human sacrifice, and it's where they burned sewage and garbage in the valley of Hinnom. That's Gehenna, literally. That's, there's a place, and it looks like this. Next one. So this, this right here is the Hinnom Valley, and I've walked through it. And it makes me a little nervous. It's a little iffy. Even in peaceful times, right now, I wouldn't want to be down there. Um, uh, they're having problems in Israel and Palestine right now, if, if you haven't heard, including in Jerusalem, of course, where it started, I believe. Um, this up up here to the, to the left, that's north. Jerusalem's up there. So the, the sewage rolls down, the garbage is thrown down, and they burn it. And the prevailing winds go toward the south east so it blows the the stench and the smoke away from the city it's in the right place and jerusalem is high enough that it would have been on a rare occasion that there would have been winds to you know blow that all back up there so it's it's the best place you could think of a deep valley ravine with the winds going the other way nice place for a sewage and garbage dump this is the uh this is the landfill down there and it's on fire now this val this is the little uh village of Palestinian village of Silwan. It's on uh, the Mount of Corruption. And just right here is the, the very corner of the Mount of Olives. And of course, up here is, is uh, excuse me, I'm doing it backwards. That's the Mount of Olives over there. And then Jerusalem is up here. Right. You can see it uh, on in front of you for those of you who are doing it on uh, Zoom. Jerusalem's to the left. Straight ahead is the Mount of Corruption. Um, so I'm going to hit the pause button. I don't know if this is new information for you, but I don't want to go rushing ahead before you, you take in what I've said or get a chance to ask questions about what I just said. Anybody want to jump in and do we have Gene yet? We do not have Gene. Mm -hmm. you, is, yeah. is he asking to get in? Mm -mm. Can you send him a message? Sure. Okay. 
Because I don't have his email. You have it on your list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do have his email. Mm -hmm. Pardon us for a minute while we pause and and try to hit up Gene. Question. Yes. Who named this place Gehenna? I'm sorry? Who named this place Gehenna? I don't know who named it uh, Gehenna, but it supposedly originally was in the Old Testament period when they named it after the son of Hinnom. Uh, it was Bar Hinnom for a while. It was Gebar Hinnom, which means the valley of the son of Hinnom. And then it got shortened to Hinnom. Somebody named Hinnom. And that's a that's a Hebrew name, so I really don't know. I don't know who it was. That's a good question, though. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I always tell people when I don't know. Is that Debbie? Mm-hmm. Okay, where's the where's the one I sent to you and Jean? Right there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, his email is that's it. Gino at nctc dot com. Gino at nctc dot com. Gino at nctc.com. All right, so back to uh, back to business. Mm -hmm. All right, and, uh, any other questions before we, we go ahead? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you more about Moloch and Gehenna next, so you'll understand the context of this word and what it really means. We ready to go? You with me? All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, she's doing the email. Okay. All right. So uh, there's an artist's rendering of what they think Moloch looked like. Okay. So Moloch was an idol of the Ammonites to whom they burned and sacrificed their children. Its face was like a calf. Its hands, as you can see, are ever outstretched to receive its gifts or offerings. The priests were called Shemarines, and you can find this in 2 Kings, Hosea, and Zephaniah. Um, king, uh, the two kings of Israel actually reinstated this. I mean, think about it. Talk about messing up. King Ahaz and King Manasseh, in accommodation to local pagan rituals to keep people happy, they reintroduced, quote, children passing through the fire to Moloch, child sacrifice. You can read about it in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah. And the Valley of Hinnom in the Bible is called in two or three places Topheth as a nickname. That means the place of fire. All right, Because what you do is you put the baby on the hot hands of that molten statue while a fire burning in its lap cooks the child. Now, you might wonder, how can people ever have been so abhorrently brutal and idolatrous but it's recorded and there are records all around the world of this kind of thing think about the mayans and the, and the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that they sacrificed to their gods um so it's a terrible practice the uh king josiah uh finally in his reforms outlawed this uh barbaric practice and uh, though it was already outlawed in Israel's legal code, he re-unlegalized uh, re it, or delegalized it, or super-legalized it. Uh, Leviticus, long before this time, had the words, You must not give any of your children as an offering to Moloch, so that you do not profane the name of your God. Okay, you got the picture? It's a place where they sacrifice children to an idol. We're talking about idolatry here. That's important to remember for later. This is about idolatry. All right. Now go to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. So. Hello. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me tell you about when Gehenna was a burning sewer and dump. Okay. Once this valley once defiled by idolatrous human sacrifices, Gehenna became, quote, a receptacle of carcasses and criminals' corpses of the city of Jerusalem. The Hinnom Valley, Gehenna, became Jerusalem's burning dump and sewer. For practical purposes, because all waste in Jerusalem flowed away from the city into the Hinnom Valley, and because of its defiled past, 
a place of pagan worship that practiced child sacrifice, Jerusalemites made this valley their sewer, their dump, and their body disposal site. In the Old and the New Testament times, the fires of Gehenna reportedly never went out. Imagine that. Mm. You know, they had to burn it day and night to keep it from piling up. Wow. I mean, they, they didn't have, you know, Georgia Power, and they didn't have mm -hmm. the waterworks people around here and all that. What does it look like now? I just showed it to you. It's the picture, a picture, the picture of the Green Valley. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Green Valley is the Hinnom, okay. That's the Hinnom Valley. All right. So the next one, please. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about Hinnom Valley in the Old Testament. Hinnom, pronounced Hinnom. Hinnom in the Old Testament occurs only eleven times, in eleven verses, and none of them is in reference to anything other than the literal Hinnom Valley south of Jerusalem. These are all 11 of those verses listed here for you to look up if you like. Right there. None of these 11 references to the Valley of Hinnom in the Old Testament has anything to do with the afterlife. And the Valley of Hinnom is a real valley, and it's not referred to metaphorically as anything else either. It's just a geographical place that's referenced 11 times in the Old Testament, and those are the references right there. All right? You, you with me? So how come Jesus all of a sudden throws it into his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount? That's a good question. Check this out. Next one, please. All right. All right. So, here's a little chart showing where this word occurs in the New Testament. Seven times in Matthew, three times in Mark, once in Luke, and once in James. Now, what we're going to focus on is three of the Matthew ones and all three Mark ones, because they are essentially the same verse repeated with one little difference each time. You remember those verses where it says, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, cut off your foot? Okay, that's what those are. That's six of the 12 mentions of Gehenna is the repetition of those six verses. Repeated in Matthew and repeated in Mark. It's not new information about Gehenna. Uh, there's no explanation about Gehenna. Um, the writers of the Gospels, Mark and Matthew, they... They assumed people knew what they were talking about, I guess. There's no definition. There's no description of where it is. It just says Gehenna, which is the Greek transliteration of Gehenom. And everybody in Jerusalem knows what Gehenom is. It's as familiar to them as the Kidron Valley or as the temple itself. It's right there. It's a part of their lives. Anybody who goes to Jerusalem knows where Hinnom is. So here's what's interesting to me. All right. So it appears 12 times in the Bible. We've already established that. It appears in four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and James. What that means is, though, that this word's not in the Gospel of John. This word's not in any of John's epistles, John 1, 2, or 3. This word's not even in the book of Revelation. And even more dramatically. That's strange. I know, I know, but this is even stranger. Okay, think about it. The Apostle Paul, y'all think about this. The Apostle Paul, the greatest, arguably the greatest evangelist of the Christian gospel that ever lived, mm -hmm. wrote more books of the New Testament than any other writer. You know, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Philippians, and on and on. Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, all of these great letters, Philemon, of the, of the New Testament, Okay, and he never used the word Gehenna once. Now this this is the greatest evangelist ever. He has been charged with, by Jesus Himself, face to face, mm -hmm. to take this gospel primarily to the Gentiles. And he goes out into the Gentile world and he starts these churches and he preaches the good news. And then he writes them letters to help them understand that good news and reinterpret that good news and correct what they're saying about that good news and how they're treating one another in light of that good news. And he doesn't use the word Gehenna. In other words, Gehenna must not have been a very important word to the gospel or he'd use it. Hmm. So what's up with that? Paul doesn't use it. John doesn't use it. 
It only appears seven times in Matthew, three times in Mark, once in Luke, and once in James. James talks about the, your tongue being like Gehenna, you know, like a fire. But he doesn't say it's an afterlife place. So what is, how does Jesus use the Hinnom Valley in his teaching of the Sermon on the Mount? Let's look at it. Let's don't presume that it's afterlife or not afterlife. Just with an open mind, look at what he says. Next slide. And then, okay, all right. Here they are. That's, that's six of the 12. That's six of the 11 that Jesus, 11 times Jesus used the word. James used it once too. That makes 12. Okay. So what, is, what, is, what does Jesus say here in the Sermon on the Mount um, in uh, chapter 5 of Matthew? He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away. For it's better for you that one of your body parts perish then the rest of your whole body being cast into Gehenna. What's interesting to me is he, why does, why does Matthew do this? I really was surprised when I saw it. He repeats the same thing again. Jesus says almost identically the same thing again in the 18th chapter of his gospel. So now this saying about plucking out your eye, mm -hmm. twice in Matthew's gospel. It's just a repeat. Mm -hmm. So a little different. He more follows Mark's wording this time. He says, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away. It's good for you to be one eyed and enter life rather than have two eyes and be thrown into the Gehenna of fire. Now look over to the right. There's Mark's version, which probably Matthew borrowed because Matthew, I think, had a copy of Mark's gospel on his desk and so do most scholars. So uh, one of his primary sources, not the only one, but a lot, one of his primary. So Mark says, if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it away. It's better for you to be one-eyed and enter into the reign or kingdom of God than to have two eyes and be cast into the Gehenna of fire. All right? Now, let's go back to Matthew. Um, this time, it's about your hand, but it's the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's good for you to have one of your body parts, one of your members uh, to die and uh, to perish and um, so that your whole body not be cast into Gehenna. What does Mark say? Same thing. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to be maimed mm -hmm. to enter life than having two hands to go away to Gehenna to the fire. And then only Mark has the one about the foot. That's the only, ref th this little parabolic thing that mm -hmm. Jesus is doing here, this little parabell parallel saying, the eye, the hand. Well, we have the foot here from Mark. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life lame than having two feet and be cast into Gehenna to the fire. Okay. Mm. That's half of the 12 uses of Gehenna in the Bible, okay, the New Testament. So what in the world is Jesus getting at? So if you if you can figure one of these out, you figure them all out because they're the same. All only thing changes is which body part. Mm -hmm. So if your eye, if your hand, if your feet, okay? And here's a hint. When you are, when your life is ruled or enslaved by something like an addiction or a criminal behavior or abuse of someone in your family. When, when those kinds of things are going on and you're filled with wrath or hate, it is a kind of idolatry, isn't it? An idolatry of the eye, idolatry of the hand, and idolatry of the foot. We'll get to that in a minute, but I'm just planting the seed of idolatry, right? I think someone is typing in some stuff. It could be Gene. Could be Gene. I'm checking mm -hmm. Gene. No, he, he, that's not new. I'm wondering if it's my connection. That, that's not new. I read that, I read that 10 minutes ago. So we can keep going here, I hope. All right. Okay. So the next one, let's, let's just, let's just, to be sure we're on the same page. Can we go to the next one, please? Sure. Thank you. All right. So 
Jesus is saying, if a body part causes you to stumble, amputate. Mm -hmm. It's either pluck out your eye or be thrown in the burning dump. It's either cut off your hand or be thrown in the burning dump. It's either cut off your foot or be thrown in the burning dump. Right? So I decided to add, I hope you don't mind, it's a little irreverent, but I, I'm adding a little humor here. I know this looks like a pirate, but he is missing an eye. Go to the next mm -hmm. one, please. He is missing an eye, a hand, and a foot. And let me tell you something. In the bubble, they like to call themselves literalists. We take the Bible literally. Well, if you do, how come you got you know, you still got two eyes? Because <laughs> we're perfect. How, how come you still got two hands? How come you still got two feet? I mean, if we're going to take it literally, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, cut off your foot, or you're going to be thrown in the dump. <laughs> so how come more Christians aren't walking around with one eye, one leg, and one hand okay i know that's irreverent to ask but you, you see when people say they take the bible literally they don't know you can't because mm -hmm. when jesus uses analogy similitude or, or parables he, he he's making it up okay he's being creative it's a literary device to help people see deeper truths when he talked about the parable of the good samaritan or the par 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 parable of the prodigal son those things didn't happen. He made it up. But just because it isn't factual doesn't mean it isn't true. There's a difference between fact and truth. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, the fact is a verifiable incident that occurred in history. Okay, Truth doesn't have to be a verifiable fact because a parable can have deep, deep, sincere meaning and truth. It doesn't have to be factual to be powerful. Mm -hmm. And Jesus knew that. That's why he taught in parables. They were effective. He's telling stories like a novel or a short story or a poem, mm -hmm. like the psalmist. The psalmist talks about the leavens of uh, the, the the trees of Lebanon skip like a calf. Well, did they? <laughs> did the trees of Lebanon skip like a calf before the Lord? No, but it's beautiful and it's true, isn't it? That all of me, in our hearts, we feel like all of nature is praising God. That's beautiful, and it's true. That's an experience. It's a truth we know. So that's the difference. That truth. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, pause right here and mm -hmm. see if there's some questions. I've got just a few more uh, things to point out about what I think Jesus means. And then I've got a couple of closing questions. But let's pause here. So uh, where are we? How are you feeling about all this? I'll, I'll look over to the... Uh, Facebook. Facebook as well. See what's going on there. I'll have to turn off the and sound now because it's uh okay. Oh, renewed and rebooted. No Zoom. Uh, just lurking on Facebook Live. Carry on, my wayward son. Oh, I know that song. Carry on, a wayward son. <laughs> and hello from Paula and Sheila. Oh, there's several people here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any questions here? Uh, don't see any. Sheila says she tried to get on Zoom as well. Yeah. Well, for some reason, I had a problem getting on Zoom. I'll tell you what I had to do. I had to go back and recopy her address. Mm -hmm. I had to close my browser. I had to reboot my browser. And then sign into Facebook again. And then, um, went and then sign into my email. And then when I opened up the Zoom, it worked immediately, just like that. So something was up with Facebook and getting connected, or mm -hmm. Zoom and getting connected tonight. I don't know what it was. Um, so I don't see any questions here. How about on the Zoom people? You all got any questions before we go on? I'm almost done. I'm going to talk about what I think it means. Is anybody here, like, wondering, okay, where does the afterlife part come in? Because I haven't seen it yet. Have you seen it yet? I'm not no. sure I've seen it. No. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here we go. But I have a question then. Okay. So I'm thinking about Gehenna. So when you were talking about this same picture here, the literal, the, the body part mm -hmm. being thrown into the fire there. So I'm thinking about people who does not live in a part of I guess I guess it doesn't matter then. It's just it just applies for those who live in that part of the world. No, I just think that um, that 
it was easy enough for most people who had an idea about Hebrew faith, and most of the converts did initially. They, they knew, even though the Gospels were written probably after 70 A.D., between 70 and 100 A.D., they still, there was still a intense knowledge and appreciation and love for the temple and Jerusalem, even after it was destroyed in 70 A.D., and I think that their knowledge of the Old Testament, too, would, they wouldn't know what Gehenna meant. They spoke Greek. They, most of them knew Hebrew. Um, uh, those that were, even those that were converts learned Hebrew at the time. So I don't think, I think there would have been some teaching going on. I think some people would have needed to, some help. What, what, is, what is Gehenna? Mm -hmm. But there were enough people, especially among the people like Paul, who just said, oh, that's a valley in Jerusalem. You know, it's where we burn the garbage. That's, our, that's where our sewage runs to. Terrible place. Smells to high heaven. You don't want to go there. They used to sacrifice children to Moloch there. But what's Moloch? Well, it's an old Jebusite god. An old Ammonite god. You know, I think there was teaching and learning back then going on just like there is today. Mm -hmm. We just probably need more today because 2,000 years have passed. You know? Mm -hmm. So, let me give this a shot. Okay. at what this means. So this is the next slide, and um, I'm holding it up so hopefully that the people on, uh, Facebook. on Facebook can see it. So the context is important. You know, he didn't just talk about Gehenna out of context. No, it's in the middle of a chapter, and the, one of them is the middle of the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. So Let's look at what was going on where these sayings that I just shared with you about plucking out eyes and hands and feet, where are those located? What's, what's Jesus talking about in his message when he all of a sudden introduces Gehenna? So if you look at Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking about dangers, spiritual dangers of being wrathful, intractable, lustful, greedy, Jealous, lying, vengeful, hateful, and hypocritical. These are Gehenna-born behaviors, and they will kill your soul. He said instead, don't harbor anger. Don't, in other words, don't be wrathful. Mm -hmm. Be reconciled to those whom you have wronged. Respect the boundaries of other people's marriages. Don't divorce for frivolous reasons. Don't lie and gossip about people. Don't return insult for insult. Don't seek revenge. Love your enemies. Pray for those who lie about you. And love without partiality and prejudice, and you will be children of your Heavenly Father. Okay? So in the middle of that, he talks about, parabolically about what it's like when your eye and your hand and your feet are being doing wrathful, intractable, lusting, greedy, uh, addictive, hateful, vengeful, hypocritical things. He he uses the hand and the feet and the eye to kind of emotionally separate it from it being you. It's as if your hand is dragging you to do to pick up that gun, as if your feet is your feet are dragging you to the racetrack. You know, and you don't have, and you've already mortgaged everything you, and took out loans on everything you own, including your daughter's piano. You know, mm -hmm. you're in Gehenna. That's how you go to Gehenna. Okay, it's these behaviors. He's giving an illustration of what your your idolatrous, and abusive eye and foot and hand can do to your soul, to your family, to your life. All right. Now, let's look at what the context is for Matthew 18 and Mark 9, because it's similar, all right? Jesus is saying things like, humble yourself like a child. Mm -hmm. Welcome others as you wel would welcome a child. And don't cause any of my children to trip. Don't despise anyone, no matter how hopelessly lost you think they are, because God gives up on no one, including you. If someone wrongs you, Go explain it to them. They might listen to you, and you might gain a brother or a sister. Forgive again and again and again, and have peace with one another. And in the middle of that, he puts this saying about pluck out your eye. If it's doing stuff to trip any of these up, 
It, if, if you're doing something other than this, it's because your eye or your hand or your foot has drug you into a compromising situation. You know, if you have to drink, you have to have that drink. It's in your hand. You got to have it in your hand. And it will drag you right into the gutter. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It will destroy your happiness. It will mm -hmm. destroy your family. It, it can ruin everything. It can drive you to kill yourself. It will definitely kill your soul. And that's what Gehenna is, as, as I see it. All right, next slide, please. All right, so. The idolatry of the eye, the hand, and the foot. All right? Wrathfulness, intractability, lustfulness, greediness, jealousy, vengefulness, hatefulness, hypocrisy, addictive behaviors, meddling, cheating, stealing, lying, etc. These are the idolatry of the eye, the hand, and the foot. And I'm going to read exactly what I wrote here because I think it's reasonably clear. Jesus, I hear saying, don't let the object of your eyes jealousy, your eyes covetousness, your eyes greed, sacrifice you to Moloch. Don't let your hands grasp on the weapons of theft, forgery, drunkenness, vengeance, and wrath drag you into the gutter or into prison. Mm. Don't let the perverse, addictive destinations of a wayward foot march you off into the valley of a burning, of burning sewage and trash. The idolatry of the eye. The idolatry of the hand and the idolatry of the foot enslave you to Moloch's Gehenna. Your life can become hell. Hmm. Okay? Now, I have some suggestions and then we'll, uh, we'll go with some conversation. Lynn just joined us. Hey, Lynn. Lynn. Okay. Next one, please. Stay with the program. Okay, mm -hmm. so may I suggest, Jesus is not trying to save you from God. He's trying to save you from yourself. By Gehenna, Jesus means death by spiritual slavery in the here and now. Gehenna is our blind, desperate attachments that separate us from real life and liberty, and Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. What he's saying is, and this is not pretty, okay? You will either lose a body part or your soul. You are either maimed or destroyed. You live maimed or not at all. And anybody who's ever talked to you about being an alcoholic will tell you that's true. Because they want it all the time. They like it. People who are addicted to cigarettes and it's killing them, they will tell you in a minute, I love everything about it. I love the feel. I love the taste. I love the way the drug makes me feel. I love the smell. I love the smoke. I love the aroma. I mean, it's a love affair. And when you cut off that hand that's holding that cigarette, it's grief like you've lost a loved one. You either go through life maimed or destroyed. Okay? Those are the options. All of us are wounded. All of us. You don't get through life without wounds and scars. The only way through life is forward. And to go forward, you go maimed. Maimed is survivable. But a living death in the idolatrous burning dump is not. We all have our battle scars. It's no shame. I hear Jesus asking, wouldn't you rather live scarred and free than unblemished and in chains. Wouldn't you rather be pain, a pain-free amputee than for your whole self to be in constant torment? Wouldn't you rather see life with one eye than see Gehenna with two? Hmm. So here's your test. Here's your test. It's one question and it's multiple choice. That's not it. That's not it. That's it. Okay. Okay. So you have A through E. Looking only at the six verses that we looked at tonight from Jesus about the eye and the foot and the hand amputation. Are you literally going to pluck out an eye? A. B. Are you literally going to cut off a hand? C. Are you literally going to cut off a foot? D. If not, are you literally catching a flight tonight to Jerusalem to set yourself on fire tomorrow in the Hinnom Valley? 
or E, none of the above. <laughs> I think that goes without saying. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's skip to the last one. Mm -hmm. Here's my final questions to you. Do Christians like and want Gehenna to be God's literal afterlife torture place where bad people feel flames sealing their flesh forever? And if Christians want and like that idea, no matter where it came from, Bible or not, why do they like that? Because mm -hmm. it's a way to be in control and it's a way to let them and they, you know, the other, um, know that if you don't straighten up, there's some punishment. I think if there's something about being in control and there's something about, you know, this one down, I'm saved, I'm living right, I'm living holy, um, and you're not. There's something about that that gives, that empowers one. Um, well, it's false empowerment, but because when you say that, that's, that's our definition, remember, from our study earlier, that's our definition of wrath. You don't have to be red fest and angry to be wrathful. All you have to say is what you just said. It makes me feel good to imagine that you are judged by God and are going to burn forever, and I'm not. That's wrath. That's judging other people. Jesus said, don't do it. Why are they your problem? It doesn't help. It doesn't make you any better, or literally, it doesn't make you any better. You may feel superior, but that mm -hmm. righteous superior, self-righteous superior feeling is the result of a false belief or sense of reality. Because what you're thinking is probably false, mm -hmm. and it's arrogant, and it's judgmental and wrathful toward other people. It's like we said, you know, everybody brings up Hitler. Well, surely you don't think Hitler. Is going to get off scot-free. Like, <laughs> Hitler's not your problem. Why are you judging anybody? Just stay off other people's tracks and keep on your own. You know, love mm -hmm. people, live life, don't judge. You don't, you don't know what people are going through. You have, you have, you're a limited human being with, with a broken insides. How are you supposed to understand who does and doesn't deserve judgment? It's really an immature and mean thing to do. Besides, you know, I remember, uh, you know, my, my high school was like half Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of my Christian friends happened to be a female. Uh, we were sitting in the English class before the class started, before the bell rang. And they were talking together about religion. And my Christian friend said to the Jewish girl with a smile, well, you know, you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus. And, you're, and I just, I, I just cringed. But I didn't know why at the time. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't understand that that's wrath. <laughs> and and the idea of wrath is that it, on the day of wrath or the day of judgment it comes back and bites you and you feel what it was like to be treated that way by you mm. not a good feeling for anybody I, I just want to have to be able to survive that moment myself I'm not, I, don't, mm. I, I ain't got enough sense smarts or wisdom to know whether to, you know, that's going to be survivable for anybody else but I, I know that won't be easy for me. I don't want yeah. to know what it feels like to have been hurt by me. Yeah, Not good. Deep, yeah. Not good. Well, I'm looking at the. Uh, I'm looking. I'm not seeing any questions or new comments over on the Facebook side. So let's go to the uh, Zoom side. Zoom people. <laughs> Do pe you think people? You think Christians really like and want God to be first and foremost a torturer? That maybe if we can talk Jesus out of talking God out of torturing us, we might. Maybe if we add a little, some good works and some hallelujahs and maybe cry a couple of sincere tears, you know, maybe the torturer won't do what he's been planning to do since we were born, which is torture us forever. You know, some people like do some. I, I get the feeling that some people like that when you start studying Gehenna and show them what it really is. I, I there's resistance. It's like, no, you're not going to take away from me the hell I know and love. You know, well, how can you know and love <laughs> that? But anyway, so tonight we looked at half of the uses of the word Gehenna in one study. There are twelve. We looked at six, all from the lips of Jesus. 
I'm, I didn't see afterlife torture. I, I saw Jesus talking about how to live and how to treat people and how to have peace in your relationships and how to be a child of God and how not to get uh, uh, lured by the lust and the idolatry of your hand and your eye and your foot dragging you into places that kill your soul and destroy your life and the people around you. It seemed like to me that this was pastoral care at the 100% level of, of clarity and effectiveness. You know, great use of an awful place, an awful place of idolatry and fire and death and body parts and dead kids, you know, a terrible place. And that's where our hand and eye and feet drag us when they are idolatrous and they worship that thing they've got to have in their hand, that thing they've got to be seeing, that thing that their feet have to be going to. Mm -hmm. Haven't you ever felt like through temptation that you've been drug against your will and you end up doing the thing you said, I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. And then you do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's what Jesus is talking about. You know, finding the power and the grace of God and power of the Holy Spirit to somehow begin to Cut that off and heal our wounds and go forward maimed, but free, not chained, not enslaved, not tortured, but free. Speaking of free, I know we didn't get into heaven. Um, indeed, because I was thinking about some scriptures around that then in Corinthians and Thessalonians about being caught up together in the clouds to be with the Lord. That's Thessalonians. The yeah. And, um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, okay, that, that's, that's a, um, a big subject because that's, that's dispensationalism, millennialism, and rapture theology, which was born of in, in a fundamentalist bubble in the 19th century, okay? Nobody believed in rapture until that those people started passing it around. So there's a real problem with that. But I don't see what it, I'm not sure what it, how it's no, related I know. to it's, this. Well, I know because it's mostly hell. I mean, we didn't get into heaven. And so those scriptures are related. Um, when we well, hear Jesus, about it, let me just say of... that Paul is clearly talking about the resurrection of the dead, trying mm -hmm. to comfort the, Christ, the Christians in a new church in Thessalonica. Who had asked him, well, you know, our, our parents and grandparents, they passed on and they didn't get a chance to hear about the grace of God and Jesus Christ. So what, what happens on resurrection day? Are they going to be okay? And Paul says, yes. In fact, you'll enjoy seeing them rise first. And then we will be changed and we will all be together with the Lord. Rise where? From the dead. To? Life. So why are you changing the subject? Well, I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm trying to relate the two because often hell. heaven and hell, you know, whenever well, you're well, here. What, what does resurrection have to do with heaven and hell? I mean, I'm not sure I'm following Well, I'm you. talking about the way how it's taught in ah. terms of in he heaven and well, hell. Well, how is that? I don't understand. Okay, tell me how they do it in the bubble. <laughs> okay, so if you're saved, you get, you get raptured, and if you don't, you get left behind. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Of course, the opposite is true in the in the reference that that uh, Jesus makes to Noah. You know, it's the it's the baddies who who are swept away, and the good people are left behind. Hmm. So the rapture people have it backwards; they have it absolutely wrong. But I wrote an article on that. If you want to read it on my blog spot on the rapture, and we can talk about that some other time. Mm -hmm. But the yeah, there is a there is a definitely a, um, a theology of rapture out there that's popular in some circles, but no nobody had ever heard of it for the first eighteen hundred years of the church, and it came out of a fundamentalist circle, got stuck in the front of Darby's Bible, and suddenly everybody in hollers and corners everywhere were starting to believe that there was this thing called rapture. The word's not even in scripture. Yeah, no, it's not in the Bible. But yeah, the it word, comes from the word. The word means snatch, Revive. as in a, as a thief snatches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, snatched away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I have a question? Mm -hmm. My question is, um, I guess just trying to relate the what you're talking about, about Gehenna and hell, and 
and just possibly the mm -hmm. translation being literal, literally taken as a place of torment because people need that that um, that opposing area. For example, you have an area of heaven which is supposed to be again mm -hmm. the, so the in the bubble that pearly gate, so to speak, type of place. Yeah, the where, perfect perfect place. Yeah. Right. So you have to have that that contrast of the worst place and that yeah. being a burning place of hell. And I guess in in just looking at what you're talking about and and it's just it's it's that contrast and yeah. just in human beings needing that contrast maybe. I, I mean well, I don't know, I'm just trying to process I, this. I, yeah, you're doing a good job. I I, I wanna ask you why, but let me make a comment first. Yeah, um, in theology, one of the biggest pitfalls um, that you fall into if you're not careful is what I would what is the theologians call dualism, because in dualism you have if you hear if you have a perfect heaven, then you've got to have a torture hell, and then if you have a devil and God, they have to be equal and opposite. So you know you see all, you hear you hear people in the bubble saying things like God um, Jesus is for you, the devil is against you. And you cast the deciding vote. Well, that kind of dualism is really crazy, dangerous, and unbiblical. Um, Satan or the devil uh, is in no way equal and opposite, and having an equal and opposite power and vote in this situation, he's already defeated. He ain't, he ain't, he ain't got a prayer. He was defeated the minute Jesus died on the cross, and death was defeated the moment he rose. We don't have an enemy that can defeat us anymore. We are still vulnerable to his temptation because we're broken and imperfect. But there is in no way any dualism going on there where, you know, Jesus is just as strong as Satan and Satan is just as strong as, and, and they're fighting over you and you decide whether you're saved or not. Okay, that puts the power of salvation on me, which means that Jesus died for nothing. So I want to say what the Bible says, he died for the world. He's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Something happened to all of us on that day. So the issue is not whether um, there's this dualistic battle going on. The battle's over. Everybody knows it. And the people who say that it isn't over have misunderstood. Maybe this will help them. But my question back at you on that is, is that, you know, what is it in human nature that just automatically wants to set up these dualisms? Uh, I don't get it. I, I know it's true. You know, we even like it in sports, you know. The mm -hmm. good guys, the bad guys, the good mm -hmm. fighter, the bad fighter. Mm -hmm. In movies, there's a good guy and a bad guy. We mm -hmm. see, everything's set up that way. Yeah. In the family, there's a white sheep and a black sheep, and mm -hmm. the good child and the bad child. Yeah. And yeah. What? 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 Is, you know? Why do? Why do we split off? We. I think sometimes we do that to ourselves. It's like we make up our minds fairly early on in our lives whether we're a good kid or a bad kid. And that carries on into adulthood. It's like seared into our memories. It's a part of our our, mm -hmm. our our brain's wiring, you know. And rewiring that deep is hard work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's set up that way. You ride around from childhood. You know, you were taught God is good, and the devil is bad, and you need to do everything to be on the good side of things. And then, you know, there's the re there are, there are rewards for that. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the bad side, then there's punishment for that. Yeah, well, um, what's you know, the difference so between that and what we tell our kids about Santa Claus, you know? It's like, if you're good, you get gifts, and if you don't, you get cold. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's, Naughty it's, or nice. it's very <laughs> kindergarten, this, this theology, of dual, this dualistic theology. And I think her question is a good one, and I want, I, I'm, Kia, if you could kind of, can you run with the ball a little bit more on that and help me understand where you're going with this dualism? Well, it's more, it's just more or less, it's, it's the thought process of you're taught about heaven. You're taught about this perfect world. I mean, this perfect place mm -hmm. where if you repent, if you constantly pray, if you're constantly this, and I'm doing air quotes here, this good person mm -hmm. of which I don't, I myself don't believe in a, and I think there are certain things that you do that are good but you be this good person, then you're going to go to heaven. Then if you're bad, what happens to you? Mm -hmm. You know, if you are evil to some people all the time doing evil things, such as murder, because of course, 
people, when they look at these things that you don't do, murders at the top of the list, like that's the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. You're going to hell. You know, there has to be a bad place for bad people, bad mm -hmm. doers. Yeah. It's sort of like, you know, it's, we try to, to uh, imagine the afterlife as sort of like when you go to court and you get found guilty and you're sentenced and, and you know, you go directly to jail. And, um, I, again, that's sort of a childlike way of trying to think about the afterlife. But the two things that came to my mind just now is that Jesus said, no one is good but God. And we talked about the Ten Commandments last week. And we mm -hmm. showed again and again where the scriptures are clear. None of us can keep them. We're all guilty. But uh, that's what the cross was for. So that our sins aren't held against us, against us because God decided to forgive. Even the ones who put him on the cross, he decided to forgive. So, if we can't do good, and if we can't be good enough, then this the, this dualizing and this performance-based works righteousness is all false. We've been sold a bill of goods. There's nothing we can do to earn it. And in fact, we're acting like we haven't already been given the gift. And like you said a couple of weeks ago, Lord, help us repent from not believing that we've been forgiven all along. Yeah. He said, you know, Paul wrote that, you know, it's it's forgiveness and grace and, and mercy that that leads us to repentance. Fear can't lead you to God. Threat can't lead you to God. Faith mm -hmm. can. And faith comes from trusting that someone's got your back. That someone was gracious to you. Someone was forgiving to you. That leads to a change of mind and life and heart. Mm -hmm. And people who have changed their life and mind and heart and aren't driven by this fear-driven performance to try to please God, they're much more likely to be happy. They're much more likely to be more loving and giving and do more good stuff because they're not doing it out of compulsion and fear and terror. They're doing because they, 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 they're grateful. They have grateful hearts for the love and forgiveness God gave them, and so they pour it out to other people. And the world's a better place for it, you know. So we somehow you're right, Kia. I mean, we got this thing upside down and, and, and backwards, and um, it's it's not about our performance. If it were, we're in trouble because if the Ten Commandments could have saved us, it would have a long, long time ago, and we wouldn't have needed Jesus, and he he would have died for nothing. Liz, Liz. whoa, were you trying to speak? Uh, no, I, I, I was trying to mute my mic so I wouldn't interrupt. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yep, we're here. We're listening. Um, so I don't know who's next. Kia, you still you got more Kia? I'm just processing right now. Yeah, it's just, it's, yeah. It's so really let, let me. See. I know it's hard. Um, I thought of one other thing. If you got something you want to say, I, I thought of one other thing I might share though. When when you're done. No, it's just it's it's a matter of processing that. It then if there is no hell, then is there a heaven? So ah, ah, see, that's where I'm going with you. Okay, so so um, e everyone, of course, in the bubble knows that heaven is the place to go. you go to if you're good enough. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's the place you go to if you're good enough when y your spirit goes to, leaves your body, and goes to be with God up, up it's there somewhere uh, when, uh, when you die. You know, if you've done everything right in, in the religious prescriptions. Okay. Problem. The scriptures don't say that. The scriptures uh, talk a lot about heaven. As you saw, it was 270 plus times that the word heaven is mentioned. And Jesus talks about it constantly. It was even in his first sermon. In his first sermon, the first thing he said was about heaven. He said, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of heaven's not far. It's among you. Mm -hmm. so we didn't go to it it came to us he said it's among you it's near you and and one time they said to him well jesus jesus is a is a false healer he's he's healing people he's casting out demons by the demon beelzebul and uh, jesus said well that's dumb if if i'm casting out demons by the power of demons then a house divided cannot stand i'm just destroying Myself, I mean, if I were evil, why would I do that? I, I'd want to help them, not kill them all and drive them out. He said, but if by the finger of God, these miracles are happening, then the, the kingdom of heaven has come to you today. 
Okay. So Jesus' presence, his power, his word, he brought the kingdom. Now, it didn't come in its fullness, but we are in it, okay? We're in the kingdom of heaven. Universe is in the kingdom of heaven. And it will come fully one day on resurrection day. We're not going to it. It's coming to us at the second coming when Jesus comes. When he comes, that's when the fullness of the kingdom of heaven will come. That's why Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is among you, near you, within you. But he also said, pray to the Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It already is in God's kingdom of heaven, but it will in one day on this earth be just as full after resurrection day. So the emphasis in the Bible is not on an afterlife place when it comes to heaven. It's a it's a vibrant, rich, present, and yet not fully come relational reality in Jesus Christ. And if you want to look at it from the perspective of eternal life, because when you say eternal life, people think, well, that means heaven too. That's mm -hmm. where you go when you die and live forever. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Look it up in John 17, 3. I say it almost every week. Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that you might know God the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he sent. The kingdom of heaven, eternal life, is a relational reality of knowing and being known in this world and in the next, in this life and in the next. So there's not much in the Bible about, you know, what, what it's going to be. It's like Paul said, now we don't know much about what it's going to really be like. We can't even imagine the glory to come. But I know one thing because he told me, we're going to be like him. When we're raised, we're going to be like him. And Jesus was flesh and bone. He said, touch me. I'm flesh and bone. He said, I'm hungry. Y'all got anything to eat? And he sat there and ate some fish in front of them. Okay. He still had his crucifixion wounds on his hands. He was a resurrected human being forever. You think, you think he turned into a spirit at some point? He is a human being right now. A living human being with flesh and bone and, and scars forever. And that's what Paul said we're going to be. Without, without growing old, without the pain, and the encumberment of this, tent, what he called a tent, we're going to get a house. A tent is changed into a house. Well, it's, it's not, not, spir it's not spirits leaving bodies. It's resurrection on the last day. Okay? Eternal. So it says eternal. Oh, we will be intent, um, not made with hands, Whoa. but eternal in the heavens. Eternal in the heavens, yes. Uh, we've gone way over. I didn't realize it was 742. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed this. What I want you all to do is keep doing what you're doing, if you will. Keep coming. And we're going to look at the rest of the uh, sayings of Gehenna and maybe one more like Tartaru next week. We'll, after that, we'll move to Hades. And then after that, we'll look at the Lake of Fire. So for the next three weeks, maybe four, it depends on how it goes, um, we're going to look at every reference in the Bible to words that are translated sometimes as hell and um should they be are they about an eternal afterlife um torture chamber uh run by god or satan or somebody mm. all right that's what we're going to do and uh keep asking your questions your questions are excellent you can you can text them to me you can email them to me you can send them to me on messenger on Facebook, however you want to do it, you can call me, text me, I don't care. And we'll, uh, we're getting great questions from you guys. And they're, and what we're building on here, and, and let me just say it in my own words. What, when we talk about these things, I hear the same little voice in the back of my head saying, yeah, but what about this? What about this verse? What about mm -hmm. this idea? What about what I was taught? Mm -hmm. What about what I've always heard? Where is that verse? What about that? Okay, well... As it turns out, this is the biggest what about, you know, when you talk about God's grace and forgiveness and salvation. The biggest what about about that is the, the tor afterlife torture place that we call hell in English. What we're looking for in the Bible is those four words that are sometimes translated as hell. Should they be? Are they in that? Are they? Is the Bible actually describing an afterlife torture place or not? Paula says, as always, it was thought-provoking. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Paula. Glad you're here. Gene, I'm sorry it didn't work out for you. On, on We've got to get that fixed. Mm -hmm. 
it made a big difference you're not being right here on the screen and talking with us you were missed yes definitely thank you so much for being here but we got to get you back on zoom bro mm -hmm. thank you um Let's see who's here, uh, Lynn mm -hmm. and uh, Debbie and, yeah. and Kia and mm -hmm. Sheila and oh, yeah, Sheila and Paula and, Paula and Jean. And Jean, is that all? I think so. Those are the ones that said anything, but mm -hmm. normally we have normally we have a, a, somewhere around 15 20 people watching. Mike's uh, always listening, yeah. Mike, Mike is usually Mike, Mike, Mike may be out there somewhere. My brother, hey, Mike, if you're there. Hello. Y'all have a great evening. I'm sorry I went over. I wasn't paying attention. I was wrapped up in what I was doing. I'll pay attention next time. <laughs> yep. This is this well, is interesting. Thank you. See yeah. you all soon. Yep. Very yeah, thought provoking. Okay. Thank you all. Have a good night. Bye bye. God bless. Okay. Alrighty. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the uh, other one over here mm -hmm. and let it play. Goodbye, y'all.